want to talk about who Jesus is. That's the foundation of everything we do. A couple of years ago, I taught on the doctrine of God, so I'm not going to go into that same depth tonight. But I do want to talk about who is Jesus. And we're going to go to Colossians chapter 2. I want to establish from the outset that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. The word incarnate simply means uh, incarnation. If you, It's from the Latin carne, which if you know Spanish, you understand that. But from the Latin, it means flesh. So incarnation means in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. In other words, Jesus was more than simply a man. And he was more than a spirit floating around. He was the almighty God revealed to us in flesh. Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. That's Colossians 2, 8 through 10. We'll stay there for a few minutes. Notice we're talking about the doctrine of Christ. Don't follow the traditions of men. Don't follow the teachings of the world. But if you're going to understand the truth about Jesus Christ, you must go to the Word of God. And that's the problem with the world today and the religious world. We're prone as humans to follow tradition. We're prone to follow what sounds plausible to people. And to say that God would come in the flesh, that's a hard thing to believe from the earthly point of view. Until you actually encounter Jesus for yourself, it doesn't seem to be possible. But we have the witness of the Scripture and we have the witness in our own life. When we pray in the name of Jesus, something happens. Now you call the name of the most famous people in the world and nothing happens. If they're personally there, maybe they can help you. But if you call the most powerful person in the world, President Obama, if we called out tonight, President Obama, we need your help, he's not going to do anything for us because even the most powerful man in the world is very limited in what he can do. But when you call the name of Jesus, if he were a man who died 2,000 years ago, that's the end of it. If he were a carpenter and that's the end of it, calling on the name of Jesus should have less effect than calling on President Obama, but when you call the name of Jesus, people are healed. The sick are healed. People are delivered. People are transformed. The power of God is manifested. That lets you know it's more than just a man we're dealing with, but God manifested in the flesh. Notice in that text, verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So you have that word bodily. That's indicating his true human flesh and identity. The word Godhead indicates deity, everything that God is. And we find that Jesus is not a secondary being. He's not a part of God. He is all the fullness of God. The idea of different persons and Jesus is only a portion of God is incorrect because the Scripture says all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, let's continue on. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, prophecy from the Old Testament. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel in uh, the Hebrew means God with us. That's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. You can read it in Matthew I didn't record that here, but Matthew 1.23 tells us it's a prophecy about Jesus, and it gives the interpretation, God with us. What I want you to notice from Isaiah 7.14 is he was born as a son. Obviously, he's a human being. If we're talking about a child born of a human mother as a son, that's obviously a human. But notice the son is more than just a son. The son is God with us. Now, I can say my wife bore a son. She bore two sons. But I cannot say God with us. That puts him beyond mere human identity. Go a little bit further to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, another well-known prophecy of Jesus. We often quote it at Christmas time. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Notice this carefully. A child is born. We're talking about a real human. We're not talking about an angelic being. We're not talking about a a spirit only. We're talking about a human that was a child that was nursed by his mother, that was carried in his mother's arms, that was in swaddling clothes and diapers, a child and a son. But notice, he's also called the mighty God. Now, that's a radical statement because if you know your Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So when you say the mighty God, you're not saying a divine-like being, a God-like figure, uh, you know, a hero, a muscle man, uh, you know, uh, uh, a handsome guy. You are using an exclusive term, the creator of the universe, the only one, the one who is worthy of worship. He's the only God you shall serve. You shall not blaspheme his name, take it in vain. You shall not make an image like to him or anything else. He's the only one. And so this child, this son, this baby is called the mighty God. And if that were not enough, the everlasting father, the father of eternity, the, the creator of it all. When you say the everlasting father, you're saying the one who brought the worlds into existence. You're saying the father of the whole human race, the one who created us. That's amazing thought that this Messiah to come would be both a child and a father, both a son and a father, both a child and God. That's who Jesus is. Let's go a little bit further. John chapter 20, and I've taught on different passages like this over the years, but I'm just giving you an overview here tonight for a few minutes. But when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, that was quite a notable thing. Let me give you the setting. Jesus had ministered for approximately three years, and his disciples uh, followed him for much of that time, they saw miracles that were incredible. And they would ask questions like, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea would obey him? You know, we've never heard a man speak with authority like this. Who could raise the dead? Who could forgive sins? And so at different times, they caught an understanding or a glimpse, but yet Think of how difficult it would be if someone came up and says, you know, and of course Jesus never tried to, to uh, boast or brag or promote himself, so he didn't just come up saying, I'm God manifest in the flesh. That wasn't his style. And by the way, anybody that would come and do that, there should be a big question mark. And Jesus understood that. In other words, that's not something you can just claim. You better be who you are. And if you can be who that is, You don't need to make the claim. Who you are will prove itself. And so Jesus didn't take the approach, I'm God, you better believe on me. I'm God manifests the flesh, you better believe on me. Rather, he took the point of view, I am going to work, I'm going to preach, I'm going to teach, I'm going to pray, I'm going to perform miracles, then you figure out who I am, and then I'll confirm it to you. So uh, the disciples knew, but they didn't know. They understood, but it was hard to grasp, as as you might think. They're thinking, how could he forgive sins? Only Jehovah can forgive sins. Could he be Jehovah manifest in the flesh? Well, well, that's impossible. How could Jehovah be in flesh? How could that be? Uh, He's sleeping. How could uh, God doesn't sleep? He's there sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And then he gets up in the middle of the storm and calms the storm. Well, Well, no man can do that. So you can just imagine what's going on in their minds. And so they were hoping against hope. Then when he was crucified, many of them must have thought, well, I guess we're mistaken after all. I guess it didn't really come to pass after all. But when he rose from the dead and appeared to them, then it all fell into place. Now, if some guy prays for you and you get healed, that's pretty incredible. But maybe there's some explanation. You know, if, if uh, suddenly the wind ceased because he says, be still, that's incredible. But maybe it just ceased. But when you saw the guy be crucified, you saw him die, you saw him placed in the tomb, and then he comes back and you're in a locked room with your buddies hiding out from 
uh, the authority because you don't want to be crucified next. And this same Jesus appears in the locked room and says, here I am. That goes beyond coincidence. That goes beyond some psychological explanation. That goes beyond any human possibility. And then it dawns on you, we are dealing directly and exclusively with the supernatural. The unthinkable is now reality. Now, in the case of Thomas, he wasn't there when that happened. So when all the others said, hey, you should have been there, we saw Jesus. He said, no way. Jesus died. You know that. You're pulling some trick on me. I can't believe you had a mass hallucination. This is crazy. I wouldn't believe that. He'd have to let me feel him. I'd have to hold his hands. And not only that, it could be a a look-alike or a double. I'd have to see the scars. I'd have to put my hands in the nail scars before I'd believe. So sure enough, Jesus appears, says, Thomas, come over here. See these nail scars? Put your finger in there. And you can imagine, Thomas, it's the real Jesus, so his mind is blown already. Jesus knew what he said. That blows his mind again. Jesus is in the flesh, not some spirit. It's not some dream or vision or apparition. Here he can... He can actually physically hold him, and then it all falls into place. The last doubt crumbles. It seems incredible, but when you, elim- when, when you eliminate the impossible, all that's left is the incredible, then you believe what you couldn't believe. And so he cried out, and here's the text, the setting. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. This was a great moment of faith. Thomas was a Jew that believed Deuteronomy 6.4. He was trained from childhood. When you get up in the morning, you teach your children. When you walk around the day, you teach your children. When you sit down, you teach your children. When you go to bed at night, you teach your children. What do you teach them? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's the only one you shall serve. He's the only one you should love. All your devotion goes to one God. So when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he was saying, I now realize, admit, and confess that the God I worshiped as a child, the God I worshiped as a Jew, believing there's only one, has been manifested in front of my very eyes as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God manifests in the flesh. And if you look at the rest of that verse, Jesus answered. He didn't rebuke him. If Jesus were not Lord and God, he should have immediately denied the claim. Because no good person will allow such a blasphemous confession about them. There's something wrong with them if they were to allow that, unless Jesus were who he claimed to, who Thomas confessed him to be. And so he said, you are blessed, Thomas, because you see me and you believe. He, he said, also blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And of course, that's us today. We make that same confession. And the whole book, John concluded this passage, was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life through his name. Going on to the next verse, 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. God was revealed, made visible in flesh. Titus 2.13 This is what the church is looking for, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I've just taken a few minutes to show you that Jesus is more than just a man. He is the true God manifested in the flesh. It is scripturally accurate to say Jesus is God. You might say, well, God's a spirit. God's the Father. God's invisible. Well, you can qualify it in this way. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. We know God's Spirit fills the universe. You can't confine Him to one location. We know God's Spirit is invisible. But God can make Himself known. And the point is He has chosen to come in flesh and Jesus is the fullness of God. All of God's character, all of God's personality, all of God's power, all of God's authority, God's identity, everything that God is, is revealed in Christ. And that's why we say Jesus is God incarnate, or Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. This is an important truth. And John, going on 
in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now what is that talking about? It's really talking about understanding Jesus as God manifest in the flesh. Because later on in that same chapter, John 8, 58, he was talking to some Jewish people and they claimed Abraham as their father. And Jesus said, but wait a minute, I, I've got a, a trump card to put out here. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That resonated with Jewish minds because the, the foundation of the Israelite nation was their delivery from Egypt. And the, the key, the turning point was when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And Moses said, who shall I say is sending me? You're telling me to deliver your people, but I've got to know who's sending me. What am I supposed to tell the Israelites? And God said, you tell them I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their forefathers. I am that I am. You tell them I am has sent you. In other words, God's personal name in the Old Testament was I am. When he spoke about himself, to his people to identify himself in, in contrast to all the gods of Egypt and Cain and everything else. He said, I'm the great I am. I am that I am. So when Jesus said, you know, you're, you're so proud that Abraham is your father. Well, let me tell you something. Before Abraham was, I am. And he appropriated that title of God for himself. And the Jewish people, if you continue reading that passage, they understood that. They couldn't accept it. They took up stones to kill him. Why? Because they considered that blasphemy, to, to use a title of God for yourself. So in this context, when Jesus said, you must believe that I am he, you must understand who I am if you're going to be saved. You must understand I'm more than a man, but I'm God manifest in the flesh who's come to provide salvation for you. So, uh, we must understand if Jesus is not God, then he has no a power or authority to take away our sins. Think about it. The whole Christian faith is built on Jesus being our Savior, Jesus forgiving our sins. Whether you're Catholic, Protestant, or whatever, at, at the minimum, you believe Jesus is the Savior, Jesus forgives sins. But if Jesus is not God, he cannot forgive our sins. Notice in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, God speaking, Jehovah of the Old Testament, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And then Isaiah 45, 21 through 22, Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord, and when you see Lord in all capitals, you know that stands for Yahweh in the Hebrew text, or Jehovah, the personal name of God in the Old Testament. And there is no other God besides me. A just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none other, no other. So the God of the Old Testament, the God of Israel, Jehovah, he is the only one that can forgive sins. He's the only one who can save. If Jesus is the Savior, then we must acknowledge him as our God. In fact, when he was so bold, there was a paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2, and he forgave the man's sin. Well, the people standing around, especially the Jewish leaders, they began to say, that's blasphemous. And then Jesus proceeded to heal the man, say, you know, you, you think I'm just saying words. I, I'll show you that whatever I say, I do. And he healed him. But notice the question they were asking in, in Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, that second question was an accurate question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They were assuming we can see him as a man, therefore he can't be God. And so you have a contradiction. Here's a man who's not God. How can he forgive sins? Well, their assumption that only God can forgive sins, that wasn't wrong. That was right. That's Old Testament doctrine. 
the faulty part was thinking that because Jesus is in flesh, he could not be God. But don't limit God. I, I've talked to Muslims and Jews, and they both have this same objection. God's a spirit. God can't be a man. God can't come in flesh. And I tell them, you know, wait just a minute. God is our creator. He created us as spiritual beings in physical bodies. Now, if God could create us as spirit beings, and we all agree that we're essentially spirit beings who will live forever, but if God could create, create us as spiritual beings who will have physical bodies, who's to say God can't do it for himself? Is God less capable of doing for himself what he has done for us? Is God more limited than we are? We are spirit beings in flesh. You mean God can't be as much as we are? You're talking about the almighty, the omnipotent, the creator. Who are we to limit God? Who says God can't be God and man at the same time? Who says he can't do that? We better not limit God. Let God be God. And in this case, he did come in the flesh. Now, Going a little bit further, the Bible speaks of Jesus as the Son of God. And that's very important and significant. I've just said we must acknowledge Jesus as God. But I, we must also acknowledge him as the Son of God. The reason why is when we say the Son of God, we're focusing on the fact that he did come in flesh. When we simply say God, we think of the eternal spirit. We think of the creator of the universe. We don't think of flesh. That's the very problem the Jews had in Christ's day and the Jews and Muslims have today. If you just say Jesus is God, they say impossible. God's a spirit. But when you say the Son of God, you're driving at something. You're saying God came in a different form. So then the term Son of God does not mean a different person from God. The term Son of God means God coming in the flesh. You see, God is unique. There's only one God. God doesn't have little gods, okay? If you say of me, my son, well, humans reproduce many humans. So a son of a man is going to be another man. But God doesn't reproduce little gods. He's alone. So when you say the son of God, you're not talking about a junior God. What you're talking about is God has come in a new way, but it's the same God because he's the only God. There, can no, there cannot be another so when you say the Son of God, you're saying something unique. You're saying God has chosen a new way to reveal himself. And what is that way? It's in the flesh. So let's take a look. Now, notice the Bible never speaks of the eternal Son. That is not a scriptural phrase. It never even says God the Son. It always says the Son of God. And I'll show you why. Galatians 4.4 4, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, God is eternal. But God coming in flesh as the son, that did not happen in eternity. That happened in historical time. The son of God was born. To be born indicates a beginning, right? To be born, there's got to be something before you're born. Now, we couldn't really say God is born because that would indicate that God... You know, there was some time before God was there. But if you say the Son of God was born, then you understand that Jesus Christ, as that born as that baby, he was born a certain time. There was a time before the baby was born. There was a time before God came in flesh. God was always God, but God was not always in flesh. So the Son of God, if you attach the term Son of God to mean a second person or a different kind of God, that wouldn't make sense. Because here we find the son was born in the time of the law. The son was born of a woman. So you can't have a son before there's the first woman. You can't have the son before you have the law. So to say an eternal son would imply there's an eternal law and an eternal mother. That's missing the whole point. When you want to speak of God in eternity, you say God. When you want to speak of God's manifestation at a particular time in history, you say God the Son of God, because that term Son relates to being begotten and born. Hebrews 1.5, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today have I begotten you, and again, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. This is a quotation from Psalms, it's a prophecy. Now, God says, I will be a father, he will be a son. 
Now, that makes sense in the human realm. Uh, when my wife and I got married, then she got pregnant. We found out in the course of time we we're going to have a baby boy. I could say, I will be a father. He will be my son. Okay, I'm looking to the future. Right now, I'm not a father, but I will be. God said the same thing. Now, if the Son of God is an eternal person, how could that be? But if the Son of God is the manifestation in flesh, it makes perfect sense. In the Psalms, God is speaking prophetically. He's not looking at someone sitting on a throne next to him and saying, Hey, you want to be my son one day? No. He's looking down through time and saying, I will have a plan. I will cause a virgin to conceive. And I will cause a son to be born. I will be the father. I'm not going to allow a man to conceive this holy son. But I myself will perform a miracle to bring forth this son of a virgin. Therefore, I will be the father. He will be the son. Speaking of God coming in the flesh. Not as a different God, but God doing a new thing. That only God can do. That no man could do. Only God could be the father. And so you see this term son of God relates to the incarnation, to time. Now, uh, this term son actually is speaking of relationship. When you say father and son, you're speaking of relationship. The son, uh, in, in the natural sense, both physically and uh, psychologically, you would expect that a child has many characteristics of the parent. So one of the most common uh, observations of the world is he looks like his father. He acts like his father. Even a son that may not physically resemble his dad, you sit there and you hear him say something and you say, you know what? That tone of voice sounds just like his dad. That joke, that, that twitch of his eye, that mannerism, just like his dad. Isn't that true? Every son in some way is going to, if you know the father well, you're going to see some characteristics Physically, psychologically, emotionally, somehow you're going to say, I can see it. So when we say the son of the father, we're speaking of bearing the nature of the father. And that's true throughout scripture. You can see the term son of is used metaphorically, even when it's not meant literally, like sons of the devil. That means, doesn't mean they're literally begotten by the devils. It means they act like the devil. They, you're like your father, the devil. Jesus said that. You lie just like your father does. Your father is not Abraham, your father is a devil because you lie just like him. Uh, Barnabas, the son of consolation, he was a man of comfort and encouragement. So they call him the son of encouragement. Jesus spoke of James and John as sons of thunder. You're so angry and you're so bold, you, you're, you have the characteristics of thunder. So when we talk about Jesus as the son of God, not only are we thinking of the literal fact that he was conceived by the power of God in the womb of a virgin, but we're also thinking Jesus acts like God. He looks like God. He talks like God. He has the nature of God. Now, of course, that's something we all aspire to, but we're not perfect in that regard. As Brother Brantley reminded us, all of us have sinned. But Jesus never sinned. He wasn't just like God on occasion. He wasn't just like God in a few ways here and there. You know, like us, we might say, you know, that was a godly action. But if we followed you around 24 hours a day, we might not say he's always godly. But Jesus, if you followed him around 24 hours a day, you would say he's always godly. He bears the perfect nature of God. Now, but wait a minute, God is unique. If someone has the exact perfect nature of God at all times, what does that tell you? He is God because no one can be God's equal. So when we talk about Jesus as the Son of God, we're starting to indicate, hey, he carries God's nature. He bears God's likeness. He acts like God. He looks like God. He talks like God. Then if I tell you he's the only begotten Son of God, the unique Son of God, the perfect Son of God, 100% of the time, then you say, wait, wait a minute. He is God. You know that old saying, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, whatever, it is a duck. You know, after a while, if everything matches 100%, you know who that is. And so we see this in John 15, 17 through 18. 
Jesus, one of his occasions of talking to the Jews, he says, my father's been working till now and I've been working. What he was saying is, you know, everything God does, I do. Where God leaves off, I pick up, you know. God works in me and I work it out. So he's claiming this closest identity. God is my father and the father is in me. The father's working through me. The father's speaking through me. And the Jewish people, they're saying, wait a minute. God is alone. God is unique. No one can claim to be working the perfect works of God. No one can be claimed to have, you know, God working through them and in them perfectly. No one can claim to be the perfect son of God. And so notice, they sought to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, according to their tradition, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. You notice that? They were starting to see when he says, I'm the son of God, he wasn't just saying, I'm sort of like God. He was really trying to open their understanding. If he would say, I am God, they would just say, no way, God's a spirit, end of subject. He says, I'm the son of God. I'm like God. God's working with me. God's working in me. God's working through me. God's speaking through me. And they start to think, could that be? Could that be? And, and All the time? Perfectly? Wait a minute. You've crossed the line here. So where the disciples kept thinking about it until they realized who he was, the unbelievers started saying, no, you're going too far. I know what you're doing. You're making yourself God. You're making yourself equal with God. That's exactly what he was doing. John 10, comes out explicitly. Then the, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. In essence, Jesus didn't go around saying, I'm God. But he did say, God is my father, I'm the son of God, God is working through me and in me and speaking through me. And you know what those Jewish leaders eventually said? Well, you know what you're claiming? When you really think it through, you're, you're claiming to be God. Now, were they all mistaken? If they were, Jesus should have said, oh, no, you got me all wrong. There's no way I would say that. Oh, don't stone me for that. I didn't mean that at all. That would be blasphemy. I would never say that. I'm a good Jew. I would never make that claim. If something I said implied that, I am so sorry. You know, if you came up to me after church and said, now, Brother Bernard, you did such a great job preaching. In fact, I think you're claiming to be God. I wouldn't say, well, thank you very much for that kind of remark. I would say, wait a minute. You got me all wrong. I didn't mean that at all. You know, what did I say that led you to that? Don't worship me. Worship God. Don't pray to me. I can't forgive your sin. You need to go to God. So if these Jews are saying, you know, we listened to you all this time, and we finally figured it out. What you've been saying, you've been hinting around, we finally got a rent. You are making yourself God. And Jesus stood there more or less figured it out, huh? He didn't deny it, but he accepted it. So when, when Jesus speaks of himself as the son of God, it's really a claim of deity. We should confess him as the son of God, but recognize the full scope. It means he's a man, not God only. But it means he's not a man only. He's God manifest in the flesh. All right. In other words, what we have, when we say Jesus is the son of God, we're speaking of the union of deity and humanity in one person. Now, that's a mystery in the sense that how could that be? We've never, never, never met someone like that. But yet, when you look at the scriptures, this is the only way to make sense of all the statements that are said about Jesus. Because when Jesus walked on water, when he calmed the storm, when he fed the 5,000 by mul multiplying food, when he raised the sick, when he cast out demons, when he, he raised the dead, when he forgave sins, these are activities that only God can do. Yet at the same time, he grew hungry, he's thirsty, he's weary. Went to sleep. He prayed. He was beaten. He was crucified. He died. Well, only a man could do that. So either you have to say the Bible is a hopeless contradiction or you say, you know what? Jesus is a unique individual who's both God and man at the same time. He's both. And that's what the scriptures reveal him to be. That's why in 1 Timothy 2.5 you see, for there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 
There's only one God. But the problem is we humans are separated from God. How could, be we, how could we be restored to fellowship? We could not do it. But what we could not do, God did for us. God came in flesh, became a man. And in that way, he could lead us back into fellowship with God. He, he did not become a second God. Because if he were a second person or a second God, there'd still be that gap. We'd still need a mediator. If we had to have a mediator to get us in fellowship with God, number one, we would also need a mediator to get us in fellowship with God, number two. That wouldn't solve anything. This makes it worse. Now we got two persons to be reconciled to. But what happened is, not as a second person, but as a man. And that's why the scripture says the mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. So what it's saying, if you want me to paraphrase, there's one God. But the way we get back into fellowship with God is because there is a man, a perfect man, a sinless man. God coming in the form of a man made it possible for us to have fellowship with him. So we must continue to confess only one God, but we confess something new. The new thing is not that God had another God. There's nothing new. God's never going to be different than who he is. But the new thing is God came in a new way. And so he could be our mediator to bring us back in fellowship to himself, actually. He's not bringing us in fellowship with somebody other than God. He's bringing us back in fellowship with himself, but through the flesh. So the man, Christ Jesus, becomes the mediator between God and man. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. It's not enough to know God as the creator and Lord of the universe. We must specifically know that he came in flesh as Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. And only then do we have salvation. All right, let me go quickly through this and I'll bring it to a close. We look at the humanity of Jesus Christ. He was a descendant of Adam and Eve, just like we are. See, he had to be one of us in order to redeem us. If you look in Genesis 3.15, the first promise of the Messiah, spoken, uh, God spoke punishment or judgment upon the devil, the serpent, said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. So he says, Eve is going to have a descendant, a seed, that's going to defeat the devil. So down through the line, Adam and Eve would have an offspring that would fight against the devil and win. And of course, it's speaking more directly of, of, of Mary and her seed, but that's Jesus Christ. Jesus was a descendant of Abraham. Genesis 12, 3, God gave a promise to Abraham. Uh, the, it says, in, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How has that come to pass? Well, it's in Christ. Genesis, Genesis 17, 8, also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, I will be their God. Paul wrote in Galatians three sixteen. now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. What he's saying is all the promises of Abraham are fulfilled most fully in one supreme descendant, Jesus Christ. None of the under, other descendants of Abraham could fulfill all the promises. But in, so when, when God was speaking of all the promises to all of the descendants, he had in mind the one supreme descendant of Abraham. That's Jesus Christ. So we cannot look at Jesus just coming out of nowhere, just riding on a white horse coming to redeem us. He came through the human race through Adam and Eve, through Abraham, through David. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 29 through 30, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to call him that of, uh, with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Notice, very specific, 
the Christ, the Messiah, would sit on the throne of David. He would be the fruit of his body according to the flesh. When you look at Jesus according to the flesh, he is a descendant of David. When you look at him in the spirit, he's God. But when you look at him in the flesh, he is of the fruit of the body of David. Romans 1.3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So when you look at his flesh, he is the seed of David. And these words, the, the fruit, the seed, that's a very specific words talking about human reproduction, human procreation. It's not just saying he looked like a man. It's not saying he was, uh, you know, an apparition or a ghost that had human-like features. It's saying he came through the human race. Why is that so important? Because he came to redeem us. He came as one of us. He identified with us in order to redeem us. And then, actually, he was a descendant of Mary. And that's obvious. The scripture is full of these statements. But Luke 2, 33, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Do you notice? His mother. So according to scripture... Mary was the mother of Jesus. But notice, it didn't say his father and mother. You know, if it's just speaking in a legal sense, like Mary was legally his father or his mother, he could have equally said Joseph was legally his father. So if it's just speaking in an adoptive sense or legal sense or their custodians or guardians, it could have said his mother and father. But making an obvious distinction, his mother and Joseph. In other words, Joseph is not his father like Mary was his mother. It's making a distinction that Mary was mother according to flesh. Joseph was not father according to flesh. A very clear statement. Some people look at Mary as kind of an incubator that, you know, Jesus just was placed in there. No, it came, it was a miracle of conception. But the Spirit of God moved upon the womb of Mary and brought forth that child like every other human child, but with a miraculous conception. But he was fully human. He inherited the human identity from Mary. And from Mary, going back to David, Abraham, back to Adam and Eve. And I quoted already Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, there's more that I want to say, but I want to bring this to a close right now. Why does this make a difference? And we'll just stop the, uh, the presentation at this point. But I want to I go to one more scripture, and that's in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And I'll close with this. Why does this make a big difference? When we understand that Jesus is God, we understand he has power to save us. But when we understand he's a man, that he's human, that means he identifies with us on our level. You see, if we just worship God, we might think, as most people do, God is remote, God is lofty, lofty, God is a million miles away, God cannot relate, God cannot identify, he's too busy for us, he's too exalted for us, he doesn't care about us, uh, you know, of uh, almost 7 billion people on planet earth, why would he care about us? And there are billions of stars and billions of galaxies, you know, why would he care about us? So if you just think of God, he's got the power, but he doesn't relate to us. If you just think of a man, you say, well, a man, he knows what it is to be a man. He would sympathize. He would understand. But the problem is, he's in the same boat as everybody else. What can he do? I mean, I can share all my problems with you, but at a certain point, what can you do for me? There's nothing you can do because you got the same problems yourself. You can counsel me. You can pray for me, whatever. But the bottom line, you can't save me. In fact, you need to be saved yourself. I can't save you. I need to be saved myself. So if we look at just God to help us, the problem is, how can he identify? If we look at a man to help us, the problem is, how can he have power to save us? When we look at Jesus as both God and man at the same time, you see the perfect combination. As God, he has the power and authority. As a man, he identified with us. He actually went through everything we went through. He paid the price by dying for our sins. And so in Hebrews chapter 2, I'll conclude with this. In Hebrews 2, 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, 
that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Isn't that wonderful? He wanted to deliver us, and so he partook of our identity. He didn't partake of sin, and I'll talk about that later. But I want you to notice, for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So the bottom line, Jesus became one of us to identify with us and to bring us from where we are to where he is. Isn't that a beautiful truth, a beautiful thought? That's what the gospel is all about. God reached down. God came down. God gave of himself. He came to our level to bring us up to his level. Let's stand together. And so whatever your need is tonight, I want you to know Jesus is here for you. And I want you to know that Jesus came for us. He died for us and he rose again. Amen. Why don't we just give him thanks for that right now? Can we do that together?